In the name of our Lenten Lord Jesus, fellow believers in him, over the centuries there have been a variety of reasons to observe the Lenten season. In the early church, Christians remembered with fasting and special devotions the 40 hours from Jesus' crucifixion to his resurrection. Eventually, that time was extended to 40 days. And during that time, new converts received intensive instruction in order to prepare for reception into membership in the church on Easter Sunday. On some occasions and in some instances, those new converts were invited and asked to go without certain foods for that time in remembrance of Jesus going without food in the wilderness for 40 days when tempted by the devil and also then to prove their sincerity in wanting to join the church. Later on, the official church required something. They clouded over the clear message of the Bible, God's free gift of love, and required that individuals give up certain foods for Lent in order to demonstrate what their sorrow over sin, but also to earn God's favor. God never commanded us in the Bible to observe Lent, and yet every year we mark out our calendars for this church season, even though we know that we don't have to give up anything to earn God's favor, and we certainly don't go without food. So why Lent? Why observe Lent? Why set aside time for this church season and come to special midweek worship services like you are today? Why? The Savior himself unfolds the answer in the Passion history today with three little words. It was Thursday night, late. Jesus had finished eating the Passover meal with his close followers in an upper room in Jerusalem. He had whispered to Judas, Go, do your dastardly deed. He had instituted the Lord's Supper. Jesus and his followers had sung a hymn, that's a psalm, and then they left that upper room, creaked down the steps, and cut through the dark streets of Jerusalem, through its city gate, across the Kidron stream, to an olive grove at the base of a long ridge known as the Mount of Olives, an olive grove called Gethsemane. He left eight at the gate and took Peter, James, and John with him a little farther. It had to be very late, close to midnight maybe, maybe even after midnight. And the torture of the cross is looming before Jesus. He says to these disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then Jesus went off a little ways, fell on his face, and pleaded with the Heavenly Father, Father, I know what I'm going to be going through. I know that I'm going to bear the shame, the guilt, the disgust, the punishment for all sins of all people. It's all on me. I know it. And yet, Father, if there is any way to get sins forgiven other than this, come up with it now, please, Father. But yet, not my will, but yours be done. He got up and trundled over to those disciples, his close friends. Did they offer him a word of encouragement, a little comfort, some consolation? No, they're asleep. That's when Jesus reminded them to ponder the passion with three little words, watch and pray. Watch and pray. We can hardly, bl hardly blame these disciples for being tired. They're dead tired. 
hardly blamed them for sleeping. What a week it had been every day. They trudged along with Jesus from Bethany, the village two miles to the east, along that ridge and then on switchback paths of the Mount of Olives, back across the Kidron to the west and in through the city gate, up the steps, 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 exhausting up the steps to the temple courtyard in Jerusalem every day. And there, to be surrounded by Jesus' enemies who tried to discredit him, harassed him by asking him tricky questions so that he would look bad in front of the people and the police and the politicians. And then on Tuesday evening, even they stayed up all night listening to Jesus' final instructions. Every day they went into Jerusalem, except Wednesday to do that. No wonder the evangelist Luke tells us that they were exhausted from sorrow. So Jesus now comes to these disciples. Couldn't you men watch with me for one hour? He was aware of and concerned about their physical condition, their tiredness, but he was even more concerned about their spiritual state, their spiritual alertness. And so he added, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's using Bible terms, two Bible terms, flesh and spirit, to highlight a great contrast. Flesh is the word he uses for our sinful flesh, not some diseased melanoma spot, our sinful flesh, that ball and chain that we're born with. I find nowadays, more so than years ago, people are more and more shocked when they find out this truth, that babies are not innocent. Cute, maybe, sometimes not. But innocent, no. We are all born and inherit from our parents a sinful state, a sinful condition, a sinful nature that is as dangerous and damnable as any other sin. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, whether you are a Christian or not, you've got this ball and chain to jag drag around your entire life, this old Adam, this old Eve to drag around your whole life. And it's not some simple problem or something, eh, not so bad, like strapping on a one-pound weight on your ankles to go for a jog. No, the Bible tells us the mind governed by the flesh, his sinful flesh, is hostile to God, a constant enemy of God. It does not submit to God's demands, nor can it. The sinful nature is constantly working to turn our face away from God, to plug our ears from hearing from God, to open the door to temptation. Jesus also used then the word spirit, diametrically opposed to flesh. Flesh, spirit, 180 degrees different. Spirit is a reference to the new person that's created in us by the wonderful and powerful promises of God. The Bible tells us this. God has given us new birth into a living hope, new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Another passage, you have been born again. Physically born, now born spiritually. A new person comes to life. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And how about this? When you were dead in your sins and in your flesh, your sinful flesh, God made you alive. Created a new person. God made you alive with Christ. This new person, this new creation, inside in Christ Jesus wants to please God, resists temptation, wants to do what God wants. So Jesus understood that inside of his disciples is this, is this fever-pitched battle going on between flesh and spirit, between the old sinful flesh and the new creation, between the old Adam and the new person God creates. This battle is going on inside of the disciples. And it's serious. And so he said to them three little words, watch and pray. Keep on watching. Keep watching. Keep being alert to the wiles of the sinful flesh. Be alert, not just for a few hours here in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
not just for a day or a month, but every moment of every day. With these three little words, watch and pray, Jesus is reminding them, pointing them for their, to their need, to their need to be alert to the constant battle going on inside. My sinful flesh is like a mouse that sneaks into the tiniest crack in the basement and then leaves behind its telltale evidence in a corner. It's, it's, like, it's like carpenter ants in the siding that eventually start crawling along the baseboard. It's like that horse fly that keeps buzzing around your head when you're on a walk in the summertime. You shoo it away and it comes buzzing back. That's what my sinful flesh is like. How about yours? It keeps buzzing back at us to try to get us to give in to an outburst of anger or rudeness that can offend someone's sensitivity or worries as if God can't take care of us or dirty thoughts or holding back on generous offerings as if God can't backfill our accounts or lies to cover up our errors to make us look good. I can feel that battle on the inside between flesh and spirit. Can you? The battle between the sinful nature and the new believer in us, the battle between the flesh and the spirit, it's constant and it's real. And whenever the needle starts wiggling up into the red zone, then our soul is in danger. What are we going to do about that? What can we do about that? Ponder the passion. And the passionate plea of our Lord, watch and Pray. Those three little words where he's calling out, be alert and on the lookout like a tireless watchman. Drive down the sinful nature into submission. Drown it with the threats of God's anger, but then build up the new person in you with his love. Strengthen it with the vitamins of his promises. The Apostle Paul once wrote, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Concentrate on God's words and promises and pray. Pray continually that he will use the extinguisher of his love to quench the flaming arrows of the wicked one that comes our way. This is what Lent is all about. It's our time, once again, to go to the cross of Jesus and see the punishment for our sins in order to knock down our sinful nature and at that same cross to see his love poured out which builds up the new creature within us. Watch and pray, Jesus said, to point us to our need to be alert to the constant battle going on inside. Not many hours after this agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the flesh on Jesus' back was gouged out by a scourge Thorns were pressed into his skull. Nails pounded through his hands and feet. And that's not the worst of it. He had to bear the punishment for your sin and guilt and mine. Separation from God's love. He had to suffer hell. And he knew it was coming. So when he got up and moved closer to these disciples sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane, you might think he's approaching them with a pleading tone. Watch and pray. Come on, you guys. Can't you see I'm hurting here? Can't you give me a little support? I need a little help. I need a little consolation. Can't you sympathize with me? But we hear no pleading in his tone. No pleas for himself. When he said, watch and pray, he was saying that not for his benefit, but for them. He was demonstrating that, yes, he knew this is a reminder to be alert to the battle inside, but it's also a demonstration of his love. Three little words to demonstrate his love. He's concerned about them because he knows that the battle inside is going to reach fever pitch. He knows their weaknesses. Peter had claimed undying allegiance to Jesus. I'll never leave you. And just shortly after this, he's going to be denying his Lord. James and John clamored for positions of honor. We're pretty cool, and we want to be great leaders in your kingdom. And just in a few moments, they're going to be running like scared bunnies. 
What's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to us? Will we ever see him again? Jesus said to them, watch and pray, not for his benefit, but for theirs. It's what Lent is all about. He's demonstrating his love for them. He's demonstrating his concern for them. Watch and pray, he said, pointing to his love. I once heard someone who was learning about Jesus and his suffering for the first time say to me, why did he have to suffer so cruelly? It just seems so gross. Why this gross suffering? I responded with a question. What's the alternative? There is only one. You and I would have to suffer all of that because that's what we deserve. Praise God. That the Lord Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He remains the same. He shows us the same love that he showed to his first disciples. He knows our weaknesses just as he know, knew their weaknesses. He knows our fears, our struggles, our doubts just as he knew theirs. He's concerned about us just as he was for them. His heart is big enough and filled enough with love for us just as he was for them. And this is what Lent is all about. Watch and pray, he says to point us to his love for you and for me. Purple pyramid lights a little dimmer, somber tones, solemn music. We are in the Lenten season. Why? Why observe Lent? Certainly not to prove that we are Christians, certainly not to earn God's favor, can't do that. Certainly not just to review a gory story about an innocent martyr, no. We observe Lent to remind ourselves of this battle going on inside and to refresh ourselves with his wonderful promises of mercy and love continually and day by day that gives us strength to fight the battle. The Apostle Paul was right when he wrote, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be in love and in life with God in true righteousness and holiness. That Lenten blessing is yours. Amen. And please stand.